Welcome to all of you to session three of This is the Christian Faith, in which we will be asking the question of why the Catechism. Now, the Catechism is this little booklet here. As you can see, it's very, very slim that we're going to be using as an outline for the rest of the material that we will be looking at in this course. This booklet was written about 500 years ago by a man called Martin Luther, who developed this as a tool for teaching people the Christian faith. Although when I say this, I probably should mention that he didn't start from scratch when he developed this. Instead, he took a pattern that goes right back to the early church, a pattern of using things like the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer as the basis for teaching the Christian faith. Now, I really like the Catechism very much, partly because it's so clear, partly because it's so biblical, but also because it is so small and concise. So that in this way, it gives a really helpful little summary of all of the, uh, the main teachings of the Christian faith. Now, the Catechism is never intended to be a replacement of the Bible. You simply can't replace the Bible because it comes from God himself. And whereas the advantage of the Catechism is that it's so small, the advantage of the Bible is that it's so big. You find an enormous amount of material here in this Bible. Everything from simple stories that you can use to teach the faith to children, to beautiful hymns and poems, to really profound theological explorations that can keep scholars busy for the rest of their lives. And certainly there is enough material in here to keep you busy for the rest of your life. And yet the strength of the Bible can also be a weakness because it can be hard to get your head around all of the material that's contained in here, particularly if you are a new Christian, although this can be, be difficult for mature Christians as well. And this is where the Catechism becomes so helpful, because it gives such a clear and helpful summary of the main teachings of the Bible that can be covered very quickly and simply so that any Christian can understand them. So this can be very helpful for new Christians, although this can also be very helpful for mature Christians because it gives them a really helpful outline of the main teachings of the Bible, which can help them to navigate their way through all of this. Now, very quickly, I want to also make some comments about this. So this is Luther's small catechism together with explanations. Many older Lutherans would remember studying a book like this when they did confirmation, and many of them think of this as Luther's small catechism. But actually it's not. But you can see the, the size difference between these two books. That's Luther's small catechism. This is Luther's small catechism with a whole lot of other material that's been added by scholars in more recent times. Now, I have to admit I'm not a huge fan of books like this. Um, they are well intended. Often the material in them is good. Uh, but by adding all this extra material, I think they, they end up losing the strength of the catechism, which is that it's so small and so clear and simple. And the catechism tends to get lost in all of this other material. So if someone really felt the need to add a whole lot of additional material, I wish they'd put that in a separate volume so that the catechism itself remained separate and distinct and clear. All right, getting back to this, I use this version of the catechism. You can buy it from Australian Church Resources. I'll put the website up here. It only costs about $5. But because the Catechism was originally written in German and has had to be translated into English, there are many different translations that are floating around. Some better and some not so good. I'm not a huge fan of this one. I think it's been dumbed down a bit too much. Uh, this is another one which 
I think has a reasonably good translation and there, there are other translations floating around as well. But if you want to follow along with me, it might be helpful to get one of these so that we are using the same translation all the time. But the other thing that's perhaps worth mentioning is that Luther originally developed this to be memorised. Right? He wanted all Christians to be able to know this material off by heart. This is something that I learnt off by heart, first of all, when I was doing confirmation as a teenager, and then later on as a young man, when I was preparing to go to seminary. Now, the seminary asked us to memorise the whole catechism before we enrolled. I found that to be a really helpful thing to do, particularly as a young man, because I was a bit more mature and I could appreciate it a bit more. Now, I can't make any of you do any memory work, um, but it's still a helpful thing to do. And if you think that memorising all of this is a bit too much, I would suggest that you at least memorise these three, three things. The Ten Commandments. Right, how can you live by them if you don't know them? So memorize the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. Those are three things that every Christian should know. And then if you want to add one other thing, I would suggest that you memorize Luther's explanations of the Apostles' Creed. Right? These explanations are just gems. They summarize the whole of the Christian faith just beautifully and clearly and simply, and yet at the same time, they are profound. I use Luther's explanations of the creed all the time in my preaching and teaching. Even, and even though I'm a doctor of theology, I don't know of anything better. Um, so if you want to do yourself a favour, don't only memorise the Ten Commandments and the creed and the Lord's Prayer. Also memorise Luther's explanations of the creed. All right. <clears throat> Now, after that little introduction to the Catechism, I now want to give you a little bit of a historical introduction to the Catechism, so you'll understand who Luther was and why he wrote this, which might help us to appreciate the Catechism a bit more. Now, as I mentioned, the small Catechism was written by a man called Martin Luther who lived in Germany from 1483 to 1546. At the time when Luther was born, nearly everyone in Western Europe was a baptised member of the Catholic Church. But although virtually everyone thought of themselves as a Christian, most of them had very little idea of what this actually meant. Because, you see, both the Bible and also the central teaching of the Bible, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, had been neglected and obscured within the church. So how is it that these two things should be absolutely central to everything that we teach and everything that we believe and everything that we do as Christians ended up becoming neglected in the church? Well, the answer is that this happened very gradually over the course of many centuries and for quite a few different reasons. So first of all, let's look at the Bible. How did the Bible end up being neglected? Well, part of the answer is that for most of Christian history, Bibles have been extremely expensive. Because you see, for most of Christian history, every single Bible had to be copied out by hand. And you can imagine how long that would take to carefully copy every single word of the Bible and then to go back and check it all to make sure that you haven't made any mistakes and so on. This was an incredibly time consuming process and this made Bibles extremely expensive. So a church might own a Bible or a really wealthy person might own a Bible, but for the average person, there's no way they could ever dream of owning one. Now, it is true that shortly before Luther was born, a man called Gutenberg in Germany invented the printing press. But it took a little bit of time for this technology to catch on. It's true that during Martin Luther's life, there were many printing presses in operation in Germany, and one of the main things that they printed were Bibles. And so Bibles were swiftly coming down in price. Yet they were still much more expensive than what they are today.
A second big problem was that most of the Bibles that they did have were in Latin. And the ordinary people didn't understand Latin, or at least they didn't understand more than a few words or phrases. If you'd gone back more than a thousand years to the time when most of Western Europe was part of the Roman Empire, it made sense to use Latin, because Latin was the language of the empire, which most of the common people understood. So it made sense that at that time, the Bible was translated from its original languages of Greek and Hebrew into Latin, and it made sense that worship services were held in Latin and that most of the Bibles were in Latin, and so on. But then the Roman Empire started to fall apart, or at least the Western half of it fell apart and fragmented into many different nation states. And over time, different countries and different areas started to use their own local languages more and more, and language, uh, Latin started to die out as the language of the common people. However, it continued to be used by the wealthy elite who could afford an expensive education and could uh, afford to learn Latin. And they continued to use it as the language of the law courts and as the language of the royal courts, and also as the language of the church. Right? Church services continued to be conducted in Latin, and Bibles continued to be produced in Latin. But this was a big problem because over time, the common people got excluded more and more. Right? So they didn't have Bibles in their own homes, but even when they came to church and heard the Bible being read, it was read in Latin, so they couldn't understand it. Now, this meant that the ordinary people were very dependent on the priest to educate them, which is a problem because many of the priests weren't very well educated themselves and didn't do a lot of preaching or teaching. This was particularly the case in country areas, where many of the priests weren't even capable of doing much more than just mumbling their way through the rites and ceremonies of the church in Latin and did very little preaching or teaching, and weren't even capable of doing much. In city areas, it was often better. There you might find a well-educated priest who preached a regular sermon on Sunday mornings, except even then the sermon was probably in Latin. And even with the better educated priests, they were often educated in all of the wrong things. So, for example, they would spend a lot of time studying canon law, which is the great collection of all the official statements and pronouncements and decisions of the Catholic Church down through the centuries, including statements put out there by the popes or decisions made by the church councils and so on. Then in addition to this, they spent a lot of time studying the writings of the early church fathers, who are the great bishops and leaders and theologians of the early church who were held in high regard for their Christian wisdom. And it's true that many of these were very wise men who were very learned in the scriptures, so that the things that they said were informed by the scriptures. Yet it's also true that some of them threw some very strange ideas into the mix, and all of this is at least one step removed from the Bible itself. And then in addition to this, these priests spent a lot of time studying philosophy, including ancient Greek philosophy, the writings of men like Plato and Aristotle, the writings of the Stoic philosophers, and so on. These men were highly regarded for their wisdom. And yes, you could say that they were wise, but it was very much wisdom on a human level. Uh, Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and so on, none of these men were Christians. Um, so this is very much earthly wisdom here. Uh, so that this wisdom then got taken over though and, and given a, a Christian spin and was taught to the priests. And even when they were finally finished studying all these extra biblical things and finally turned their attention to the Bible itself, they were taught to study it using what is known as the allegorical method of interpretation, which tends to obscure the plain and obvious meaning of the text. So what exactly is the allegorical method of interpretation? Well, 
if you study the Bible in this way, instead of sticking with what the Bible says at face value, you treat the Bible as if it is a series of parables that we need to decode. And the priests at the time were being taught that the teachings of the Catholic Church are the key which enable us to decode these parables. Now, I would say that sometimes an allegorical interpretation of the Bible is legitimate as long as the Bible itself is the key to this kind of interpretation. So let me give you an example of, of that so you can see what I mean. Just think about the story that's recorded in the Gospels where Jesus stilled the storm. At the most literal level, this story is simply recording an historical event where Jesus was out on the Sea of Galilee in a boat with his disciples and they got caught out in a great storm and the disciples called to Jesus to save them and he then got up and rebuked the wind and the waves so that instantly the storm stopped. Okay, so at a most literal level, this, this story is simply recording this historical event. And yet, you can also use this story as a parable for our lives as Christians, because this story teaches us something about our Lord and his relationship with all of his disciples. So we can say that as long as Jesus is in the boat with us, we don't need to fear the storms of life because Jesus is more than a match for anything that this world can throw at us. Right, so you could say that that's an allegorical interpretation of this passage. And yet to use this text in this way is more than justified by clear statements of Scripture in which Jesus promises us that he's always going to be with us to care for us if only we will turn to him and trust in him as our saviour. But this is not how the Bible was being used in Luther's day at all. Instead, doctrines that had no basis in Scripture were being read into the Bible using the allegorical method of interpretation. So again, I'll give you an example so that you can see what I mean. This example comes from Gregory the Great, who was regarded as one of the greatest popes from the early medieval period. You may be familiar with the story of the destruction of Sodom and how when the angels came to Sodom, they found Lot in the city who was regarded as a righteous man in the sight of God. And so the angels um, want to spare him. And so they tell him to flee to the mountains together with his family. But Lot doesn't want to flee to the mountains. And so he begs the angels to allow him to flee to the little city of Zoar instead. And eventually the angels agree and they say, OK, if you, refuse, if you really don't want to go to the mountains, you can flee to the little city of Zoar and we will spare that little city for your sake. And so that's what happens. Lot then flees to Zoar. Now, if you ask Gregory the Great what this means, he will say that this means that celibacy is better than marriage. Right? He says that what God really wants for us is that we would flee to, to the mountains. That is, that we would choose to be celibate, and that we would choose to give up all sexual activity and all sexual desire and so on. But if we really don't want to flee to the mountains, if this is too difficult for us, then we can flee to Zoar instead. That is, we can get married. So this is not God's perfect will for us. This is kind of a plan B. But nevertheless, if we get married, at least we will be spared from the wrath of God that will otherwise be poured out on those who are sexually immoral. Now, I could read this text a million times and I would never see that in the text because it simply isn't there. Right? What Gregory the Great is doing is simply reading the ideas of the church of his day back into the Bible and you won't find support for this anywhere in Scripture. Right? Instead, the Bible teaches us that marriage is God's plan A created right in the beginning. All right, but that's the kind of thing 
that the church was doing in Luther's day, reading a whole lot of things that simply aren't there in the Bible back into the biblical text and obscuring the, the plain, obvious meaning of Scripture. Now, I hope you noticed the little visual illustration that I was using there as I talked about all of these other things that the church was giving its attention to. Notice how the picture of the Bible got smaller and smaller. And that, in fact, is exactly what happened within the life of the church. The Bible never disappeared. People always said that it was the word of God and that it should be held in reverence. But in practice, they didn't give it the attention it deserved. And the more they gave their attention to all kinds of other things, the more that the Bible just simply got squeezed out. And there's a really important lesson for us in this. It's not enough for us to say that the Bible is God's word and that we hold it in high regard so that maybe we have our beautiful gold-lettered Bible that we put on a pro in a prominent spot on our bookshelf. Right? No, instead, we've got to take it down and we've got to open it up and we've got to read it and we've got to study it. Right? Only then will the church be truly taught and led by God. And if we don't actually use the Bible regularly in practice, the church will just slowly drift further and further and further from the truths which God himself has taught us. Now, if we get back to the church in Luther's day, I now want to talk about one terrible consequence that resulted from this neglect of the Bible. And that is that the church started to lose the central teaching of the Bible, which is the good news of Jesus Christ and God's free gift of salvation that he gives to everybody who looks to Jesus Christ as their saviour. Instead of teaching people to look to Jesus in order to be saved, the church was starting to teach people more and more to look to their own good works as if we human beings can save ourselves. So if we look at this picture on the left of the screen, this particular icon comes from a monastery from the late Middle Ages, which illustrates this teaching very well. If you look at the middle of the picture, you see this ladder reaching all the way from earth up to heaven, where Christ at the top right hand corner is waiting for people to climb up to him. And every single rung of the ladder is supposed to either represent a particular vice that we human beings have to overcome or a particular virtue that we need to cultivate in order to climb up to heaven. And you see the people on the ladder, they're all trying to climb up to heaven through their own good works. And then you see the devils in the bottom right who are trying to pull people off the ladder down into hell. And then in the top left, you see uh, angels and saints in heaven who are trying to encourage the people as they climb. All right, so this illustrates very well what the church in Luther's day was teaching. It was teaching people to look to their own good works and their own human efforts in order to win their way into heaven instead of teaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And as the church was teaching people to look to their own good works, often these weren't even the kind of good works that God has commanded, but instead the church was teaching people to focus on made up good works or, or good works that had been invented by human beings. So for instance, the church was telling people that if they went on a pilgrimage to certain holy sites, this would help them to get into heaven. So the picture here is of the church of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, or the Church of St. James in Spain. Um, the church was saying that they had here in this building the bones of the Apostle James, and that if anyone came on a pilgrimage to visit the bones of the Apostle James, this would help to get them into heaven. And there are many other holy sites in the city of Rome and elsewhere that people were encouraged to come and visit uh, on the mistaken belief that this would help them to get into heaven. Likewise, the church was teaching people that if they gave up marriage and gave up family life and became monks and nuns and took vows of celibacy and spent their whole lives uh, praying and doing other religious activities, 
that this would help them to get into heaven. The church was teaching them that if they spent a lot of time fasting, that this would help them to get into heaven. And that if they gave lots of money to the church or to other good causes, this would help them to get into heaven. In fact, the church was even issuing these little certificates called indulgences. And if you paid your appropriate fee, you could get one of these indulgences. And the church made the false promise uh, that purchasing one of these certificates would help you to get into heaven. Or, in addition, the church was telling people that they should pray to various saints, such as Mary, the mother of God, um, in contrast with the Bible, which teaches us that we can pray directly to God himself. The church was te teaching people, no, you should pray to these saints and ask these saints to intercede with you, uh, intercede for you with God. All right, so you see all of these different good works that people were being told to perform. And just as I d did with the Bible, here again I've used a little visual illustration. That the more the church told people to focus on all of these other good works, the smaller Christ became. As he gradually got squeezed out of the picture. He never disappeared altogether. Yes, the church still did talk about Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins through him. Uh, it still prayed the Lord's Prayer where we pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and so on. So there was something of the gospel that still survived within the church, but it was largely squeezed out and replaced by this focus on human good works. As a boy who was raised in the Catholic Church, Martin Luther took all of this very much to heart. And as a young man, he tried very hard to perform all of the different good works that the church was prescribing in an effort to save himself. Now, as a young man, he also showed a lot of academic promise. And he completed a degree in university and then started on a subsequent degree in law which was partly to fulfill a wish of his father's. His father was from a peasant background, but had become moderately successful by leasing and managing a mining smelter. And he was hoping that his son would go off and become a lawyer and then come back and help out with the new family business. But as Luther studied law, he was increasingly troubled by spiritual questions and the question of his eternal future. And a couple of incidents that happened to him really brought this to a head. One was where he had an accident with a dagger, got stabbed in the leg, and his wound bled very profusely so that he nearly died. And then a second incident occurred while he was on the holidays from the university. And he went home to visit his family. And then as he was traveling back to the university to begin the next term, he got caught out in a, in a very severe thunderstorm. And a bolt of lightning hit the ground very close to where he was uh, walking and knocked him to the ground. And he was so terrified that he cried out, Save me, St. Anne, and I will become a monk. Well, he survived that storm and he got to the university okay. But then he felt like he had to keep this promise. And so he quit his studies and he enrolled as an Augustinian monk. And there as a monk, he had to take vows of poverty and chastity and obedience. So he had to take a vow that he would never get married. Uh, the monks wore very simple clothes. They ate very simple food, spent a lot of time fasting, spent an awful a lot of time praying, including getting up on multiple occasions during the night to pray. Uh, they he, he went on pilgrimages to holy sites, including a pilgrimage to Rome. He would spend time out in the snow to punish his body. He spent time whipping himself. He spent an awful lot of time trying to confess every little sin he might ever have possibly committed to his confessor father. He spent time praying to the saints 
and so on. Doing all of these different things that the church told him he should do in order to win his way into heaven. And later on, he commented that if anyone could have been saved by monkery, it would have been me, because he tried very hard to do all of these things. And yet the harder he tried, the more he discovered that none of these things could give him peace of heart and mind. And he was still left wondering, have I done enough? But at the same time, Luther was also very interested in the Bible. And there in the monastery, he had access to the Bible. And often when the other monks were busy doing other things, he would sneak off to the library to read the Bible. And eventually this interest in the Bible was noticed by the head of his monastic order, who encouraged him to do theological studies. And so he did these theological studies, eventually became a doctor of theology, and was then given a position teaching the Bible at the University of Wittenberg. And he took this job very seriously. He studied the Bible night and day. Uh, he learnt Greek and Hebrew, the original languages of the Bible, so that he could understand it even better. And he would pore over every little word and every little phrase, trying to understand it, both for himself and for the sake of his students. And the more he wrestled with the scriptures, the more he started to realize that many of the good works which the church had been telling him to perform were not in the Bible at all. And in fact, many of them were contrary to what the Bible taught. But most importantly, there in the Bible, he discovered the good news of Jesus Christ. He discovered the wonderful good news that Christ has done everything that is necessary for us to be saved. He has taken all of the guilt and all of the shame and all of the punishment that we deserve because of our sins onto himself and then dealt with that on the cross. In this way, he has won for us the forgiveness of all of our sins. He has reconciled us with God so that we can now enjoy God's favor. And he has won for us the gift of everlasting life. So that there is nothing more that we need to do in order to earn our salvation. Because God gives us salvation as a free gift when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Saviour. And when Luther discovered this, he received this as the most beautiful good news he could ever possibly hear. Because finally he, he realised that the, the gates of heaven had been opened to him. So what did Luther do with these discoveries? Well, the answer is that he did everything he could to spread God's word, and then he let the word of God do its work. One of the first things that he did was he translated the Bible into German, the language of his people so that ordinary people could read and understand the Bible for themselves. And this inspired other people to follow his example. For instance, William Tyndale, inspired by Luther, translated the New Testament into English and published it in 1526. And this was a very courageous thing to do, because the Pope had declared Luther and all those who followed his example to be heretics or false teachers. And the Emperor of Germany and the King of England and many other European monarchs had placed death sentences on their heads. And so Tyndale knew that he was committing a capital crime by translating the New Testament into English and publishing it. And so he had to do this in hiding. Now Luther, he also lived with a death sentence on his head, but his local prince protected him and so he survived. But Tyndale was not so fortunate. Eventually, he was betrayed to the authorities and was captured. He was tied to a stake where he was strangled, and then his body was burned. But his legacy lived on, and we've had the Bible in English ever since. And likewise, Luther's example has been followed by Bible translators down to the present day. Ever since the time of Luther, Christianity in the Western world has been divided between Catholics and Protestants. 
with Protestants being those who follow the example of Luther in saying, we need to get back to the teachings of the Bible and we need to get back to teaching the good news of Jesus Christ and salvation through faith in him. And wherever Protestant missionaries have gone in the world, one of the first things they have done is translated the Bible into the local language of the people that they are trying to reach so that people of all nations and all tribes can understand the word of God in their own language. So in the first place, Luther translated the Bible. In the second place, he took every opportunity to preach the good news and to point people to Jesus Christ and his word. This painting here is a very famous painting that was painted by Lucas Cranach, a man who was a friend of Martin Luther's and painted several portraits of him during his life. And this particular painting was completed just after Luther's death and stands behind the altar of the church in Wittenberg where Luther did most of his preaching. And what do you see in this picture? You see Luther in the pulpit and what's he doing? He's pointing people to Jesus Christ and saying to them, look at him, focus on him, put your faith in him and you will be saved. Now, this meant teaching people that our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And all of those things is very important. That word grace means an unearned or undeserved gift. Right? So when we say that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we're saying that we do not earn our salvation in any way, but God gives it to us as a free gift when we trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone as our saviour. So this meant teaching people that our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And all of those things is very important. That word grace means an unearned or undeserved gift. Right? So when we say that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we're saying that we do not earn our salvation in any way, but God gives it to us as a free gift when we trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone as our saviour. And likewise, Luther taught people that all Christian doctrine or teaching, doctrine is just a fancy word for teaching, uh, all, all Christian teaching should be based on scripture alone. Remember that Luther discovered the gospel through his own reading of the Bible when the church of his day was teaching something very different. And still today, it is true that human beings regularly err and are deceived and sometimes deliberately set out to deceive others. Whereas God never lies and God always knows what he's talking about. So every word uh, of Holy Scripture is true and can be relied upon. And what is more brings to us God's saving power. And so as the Lutheran Church, we always make a careful distinction between human thoughts and opinions and the Word of God. And we say that the, the Christian teaching always needs to be based on the Word of God as it is found in Holy Scripture. And this very much informs my practice as a pastor. I regularly say to my people that they can always check what I say against the Bible. And if I say something that doesn't sound quite right to them, they should feel free to come to me and say, Pastor, where is that in the Bible? And if I can't show them, then they should feel free to disregard it because their thoughts and opinions are just as good as my thoughts and opinions, maybe better. Uh, but if I can show them where it is in the Bible, it's a different matter. Then they should listen to it, not because I said it, but because God said it. And we are conscience bound to listen to him and we're, we're fools. <laughs> if we don't listen to the wisdom that comes from God. And this should, same applies to everybody who's listening to this course. Um, I usually try to show people where the things that I'm teaching come from in scripture by taking people back to specific passages in the Bible. But you can't reference every scripture passage all the time. And so 
if at any point you're not clear on where something comes from in the Bible and you think that's important, please feel free to come and ask me. Uh, I left my email at the end of the introductory session. And so please feel free to shoot me an email and I'll happily have a conversation with you about that. Then in the third place, Luther worked together with his colleagues at the University of Wittenberg to train pastors and teachers in the word of God and in the good news of Jesus Christ and to then send them out right throughout Germany and to other parts of Europe as well. And then in the fourth place, he prepared the small catechism as a way of teaching the Christian faith to ordinary people. So they could have the, the Bible in one hand, which he translated, and the catechism in the other hand, summarizing the main teachings of the Christian faith for them, and then guiding them in their reading of Holy Scripture. And this little teaching tool has really stood the test of time. It's still in widespread use 500 years later, which is incredibly unusual. So why has it stood the test of time? Well, partly because Luther was such a gifted theologian and gifted writer. He had the ability to identify the most important points and to articulate them very clearly and very simply and very concisely. But I think it's also because he drew on some very important texts from Christian history and, and from the scriptures, such as the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer, which have also stood the test of time. So let's now look at an outline of this little teaching tool. The Catechism starts with the Ten Commandments, together with a little explanation of each commandment penned by Martin Luther. The Ten Commandments give us the best summary of God's law, right? the law of God as it applies to us as Christians today, as opposed to all of the rules and commandments that have just been made up by human beings so that we would know the difference. In the second place, the Catechism contains the Apostles' Creed, together with little explanations written by Luther, which summarizes for us who God is, and what he has done for us and for our salvation. In the third place, we find the Lord's Prayer, which is a prayer that Jesus himself gave to us. Although the Lord's Prayer isn't just a prayer, it's also a lesson in prayer. This was part of what Christ gave to us to instruct us in how we should pray. Then in the fourth place, there are little explanations of baptism and absolution or the, the gift of forgiveness in Jesus' name and then of the Lord's Supper, which are three different ways in which God now delivers his forgiveness to us. And then finally, there is a little section called the Table of Duties, which is really just a series of Bible texts which instruct Christians in how we should behave in different situations in which we find ourselves in life so that we serve each other in the way that Christ wants us to serve. So if we put all of this together, we have a beautiful little summary of what every Christian should know so that they can live the Christian life. So that's all for this session. And in our next session, we will start looking at the Catechism in a lot more detail. But for now, I would like to start a new habit, and that is to close every session with the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer so that we start to get these really important texts into our heads. So let's do that now. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.